Welcome to Brentwood Baptist, and thank you so much for being here with us this morning. If this is your first time to join us, we'd like to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you're here. Will you let us know that you're here with us this morning? We would love the opportunity to connect with you and help you discover your place for community. You'll find a communication card in the pew racks in front of you or in the bulletins in Hudson Hall. Please fill out the card and make sure to drop it off in the offering plate as it comes around later in the service. Our annual Vacation Bible School is set for June 10th through the 14th at our Brentwood campus, and we are looking for volunteers. Last year, over 500 of you served over 1,300 kids on their journey towards Christ. If you are interested in volunteering at VBS, check out our bulletin for more details. Discover is a two-week class where we unpack who we are, what we believe, and how we support you and your spiritual gifts within our community. If you are new to our church, or if you've been attending for a while but aren't a member yet, this is the perfect class for you. Discover begins today in Wilson Hall at 4 p.m. Check out our bulletin for more information. We hope that you are making plans to join us for our Easter services on April 21st. We are excited about this year's Easter experience at Brentwood, and we hope you are too. It's the perfect time to invite a friend, neighbor, or family member to attend church with you. You can learn more about our Easter and Holy Week schedules for all of our campuses at eastertn.com. Thanks again for being with us this morning. We know there are many places you could be, but we are so glad that you're here to worship with us. Now let's worship the Lord together.
chapter of the revelation that were spoken by Jesus himself to us. Read it with me. Don't, Don't be, afraid. be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is worthy of our praise today. And we declare His holiness. Would you please be seated? And it's an awesome thought that we really can't comprehend, isn't it? That the holy, magnificent, powerful, all-sovereign God chooses to dwell with us and in us, has invited us in to fellowship with Him. And in this time of worship, we join our hearts together in prayer. We calm our hearts and still our spirits. David worships as he plays. And we just pray. We just talk to the Lord, expressing our love and our adoration, but also bringing our supplication, our petition before him with confidence that he hears and he speaks. So as David continues to play, let's spend a few moments right now praying together. saints and the angels song that we sing today about your love that is so amazing and so divine it demands our souls our life our all we're so grateful that while we were sinners you loved us you showed your love you poured it out on us so we come today in prayer just to respond to you with our love and our adoration. And yes, our petition. In these moments of worship, Lord, remind us that you are holding on to us and that your grace will be sufficient to meet us in every trial and every need. Thank you, Lord, that our confidence in you does not waver that we will not be shaken because we know your love will hold us. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter will
promise of God to us. Sing to him. Those he saves are his to cry. Christ will only fast. Precious Please be seated. So as we continue with worship this morning, we get to celebrate in baptism as we have Charlotte ask you. And so Charlotte, uh, over the past year or so, has had lots of little conversations with her parents and here at church. And back in September, they sat down and were reading some scripture together. And between her and her mother and her mom and her dad, they, they kind of came to a point where she understood and felt like it was her time. And so all the way up to today, we want to celebrate with her in what God has done in her life. And so, Charlotte, I ask you, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Well, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bearing the likeness of his death. Praise the Lord. You know, it is, um, it's an honor we talk about engaging the world around us and what an honor that is to have the opportunity to be a part of that journey, a part of that story to engage people, people that we may work with, our neighbors, our friends, people that maybe we don't know yet, yet. But what an honor to engage the world around us. We talk a lot of times about having, sharing your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony. And sometimes I think we forget the power of your testimony, of your story. We just saw a beautiful picture of that. But as we talk about engaging our world around us, and specifically engage, engaging Middle Tennessee, there's a day that we get to celebrate that on all of our campuses and on purpose choose to engage Middle Tennessee together. I'm going to share a quick testimony, though, that was shared with me about that very moment. A woman, she chose to be a part of Engage Middle Tennessee, and, and she got there that morning, and it was not simple to get there. Her story was not simple. 
and there were different things that she was thinking about and processing, but she looked at the sign, the logo of Engage Middle Tennessee, and she looked at it, the word, and she said, I can choose in this moment to engage, be present, or I can choose to just follow the steps. And she thought to herself and she said, you know what, in this moment, today, I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose to engage and be present right here in this moment for what God has for this moment. And not long after that, just a few moments later, later in her own community, by way of an Easter egg hunt, she met someone and someone who did not know the Lord. And by way of that relationship that was formed on that day, weeks later, that woman would come to know the Lord because that lady that participated on that day decided, Lord, I'm gonna choose to be present. I'm gonna choose to engage. What an honor that is. What an honor to be a part of that story. I want to invite you to participate with us across our campuses on April 13th to be a part of that story too, to choose to engage. We give our time, our talents, our treasure, and our testimony. Please join us and be a part. We're gonna ask our ushers to come forward and we're getting ready to, to give our offering. But pray with me as we pray for this time and the time in a few weeks ahead. Lord, thank you so very much. Thank you for just allowing us to be a part of your story. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this journey and the journey of so many around us. Lord, I just pray that we recognize how to be a light in the midst of the darkness, how to be a representative of you in dark places. But Lord, I pray that you will give us eyes to see and recognize the darkness around us so that we know the importance of what it means to be your light, your people. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we give all of these things to you in your name. Amen.
Jesus says, you want to be great? You want greatness? Give your life away for the sake of others. Everything that you hope you want, all of the thrones that you're erecting in your heart and in your life that you so desperately feel like you need, they're not going to satisfy you. But when you come with me and you give your life away, I give you the peace and the joy and the hope and the satisfaction that you've always wanted. Kingdom economics don't work like worldly economics. Jesus didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to die to save you and I from the bondage that we're in and sin and death. Know that you are here to give your life away, to make a difference for others. So take the attitude of a servant and make a difference. What role are you going to play this week in giving your life away? Last week, I was in a meeting with Dennis Worley, um, our campus uh, minister of worship who works with all our campus worship leaders. And in just flipping, uh, just in part of the conversation, he talks about our orchestra, and then he just says off the cuff that he said it's one of the best church orchestras in the nation. And we forget that. Uh, we get spoiled by that. And, uh, and we forget the quality that Mike Lawrence and his ministry brings to us Sunday after Sunday. So, Mike, we do forget, and we do take you for granted. But today we remembered. So, uh, thank you, and thank, <laughs> thank, the, thank the orchestra for us, okay? All right? And pass that word for us. Would you do that? Thank you. <laughs> While we're celebrating, did you know that this campus, Brentwood Baptist Church, has sent over 1,050 of its members to be part of the other church campus starts? We have sent away 1,050 of our members. Now, this investment has been paid back many times over uh, with the growth of Station Hill, the growth of Nolensville. Nolensville, by the way, will be moving out to the Nolensville area around Easter. We hope they'll be in their new facility sometime in the fall, and they'll be off and running. And again, uh, that doesn't count Avenue South, West Franklin, all the others. Uh, but it is an exciting time uh, for all of our campuses. It's an exciting time for here. Uh, as, you would as you would recognize that uh, sending out that many leaders and that many people gives us an opportunity uh, for all of you now to step up. Just as every other campus is different, this campus is different, and our challenges are very different. There is no other community like Brentwood, no other place like 37027. And so we have to do ministry a little different here. So we're drilling down and finding out what this means. And yes, that will probably mean some change. Now, I know the only person who likes change is a wet baby. But um, <laughs> for the rest of us, it's uncomfortable. But we have to understand, we are missionaries now in our own culture. Uh, it, you still don't believe we live in a Christian nation, do you? I hope you have been uh, freed from that illusion. Uh, but there is no better time for the gospel to shine than right now. And we're excited about what God is going to be opening up for us. So stay tuned. You'll be hearing a lot more about that as, uh, as, as things kind of develop for us and as God kind of shows us what's next. My friends who have had to learn English tell me that one of the things that makes English so hard to understand is that the same word can have a bunch of different meanings. Uh, you can hear someone say, I love my children. That has one meaning. I love pizza. Same word. Different meaning. And then there, of course, is the ever famous, oh great, love that. Same word. Lots of different meanings. And if you don't pay attention to the context, if you don't understand the inflection of the, uh, of the, of the voice, then you will miss the meaning entirely. Uh, something else that makes English hard is words will change meanings. Uh, a word that used to mean something at one time will now be transformed to mean something else totally different. Uh, the word bad. When I was in elementary school, I did not want to be a bad boy. 
But when I got in high school and college, if I was on a basketball court and I ran down the court and somebody said, Mike Glenn, you're a bad man, yeah. <laughs> I'd take that all day long. Same word. But the meaning had changed. Now, I don't know who holds the meeting where they change the meanings of all these words. I'm not invited to it. It's just all of a sudden I realize, well, that's not what that word used to mean. And sometimes the world will take words from us, and we will have to tell the world, wait a minute, <laughs> we're not giving you that word. And we're not going to allow you to change its meaning. Words like love. Our culture has changed the meaning of that word. And you know, we're not going to let them. Uh, we need to tell them, and quote the great theologian Keb Moe, and tell them, you know, I don't know what that is, but that's not love. Jesus was asked about this, and he answered in Mark chapter 12. Stand with me in honor of God's word. One of the scribes approached, and when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one, and there is no one except him. And to love him with all our heart and all of our understanding and all of our strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw how the scribe had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared question Jesus any longer. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As a scribe asked you what would give his life meaning, what would give it ultimate purpose, he didn't want to miss it. And you taught him, teach us now that we may live our lives for that which matters and matters ultimately. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Things were getting tense. They were coming to a head now. The enemies of Jesus were serious. They were going to get him. It was just a matter of time. It was just a matter of how. Mark tells us early in his gospel that the religious and political leaders got together and decided that Jesus had to go. Now, it was one thing when he was preaching in Galilee and all points north, and they could say, hey, he's a country preacher, no big deal. Now he's in Jerusalem. Now he's confronting the politics. Now he's confronting the religious leaders and calling them out. And so now they're after him. And they do it the, kind of the way that we do it. They hold a press conference of, of type. And, and they gather around Jesus and they begin to pepper him with gotcha questions. Uh, they try to find those questions that Jesus kind of has a 50-50 chance. If he answers it this way, it's wrong. If he answers it that way, it's wrong. And they want to say, see, Jesus doesn't know. He can't be the Messiah. And the people will turn on him. So we have in Mark chapter 12 a series of these questions. The first one. Do we have to pay taxes? Nothing's changed. <laughs> Same question we would ask Jesus if he were physically standing here. Do we really have to pay taxes? April 15th coming and we just, eh. Jesus has answered, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Mm. That's a good answer, Jesus. Second one was a gotcha question from the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrections. The Pharisees did. So the Sadducees would taunt the Pharisees with this question. A woman married a man, he died. So she married his brother, and he died. So she married the other brother, and he died. And she did this seven times. Now, whose wife would she be in heaven? Ha, 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 ha. 
This is also the question that got me thrown out of New Testament class. <laughs> Dr. David Garland, we're teaching this, this passage. I start laughing. Come on, it's funny. This is a funny story. And he does a professorial, well, Mr. Glenn, you want to share with the rest of the class what you think so funny? No, I'm good. Really. It's just funny to me. He said, no, no, I insist. I said, okay. Let me get this straight. A woman married a man, he's dead. She marries another man, he's dead. Marries another man, he's dead. Why isn't this woman under investigation? Somebody get in the <laughs> Somebody get in that kitchen and sniff the meatloaf. Something's up. <laughs> what would you have done if you were brother number four? <laughs> You've been to three funerals, you're next. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, that got me the heave-ho. He went on to be the president of Baylor, and, and I'm here. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is one of those sermons that's going to require some audience participation. Okay, so get out the bulletin. Uh, and in that little space they give you to write down sermons, I want you to do something. I want you to draw a pyramid. A triangle. At the top of that triangle, I want you to write God. On either side of that triangle, I want you to write neighbor and self. God, neighbor, self. In the middle, I want you to write love. Now, this is the third question that they had come. This was the hard question because there was no answer. There are over 600 commands in the Old Testament. And it was always an argument. There was always a yes, but response. If you said, this is the greatest commandment, somebody would say, yes, that's a good answer, but. And so you're always running in circles. Jesus does something really unique here. He quotes Scripture. Anytime Jesus is tested or pushed, he responds by quoting Scripture. Hint, hint. If that's the way Jesus answered when he is tested, it would seem to me it would be a good way for you and me to respond as well. So learn Scripture. Memorize Scripture. When you're tested, when you're tried, respond with Scripture. He takes a passage from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God, the Shema, the statement of faith that every Jew would have known. Everybody around him would have recognized that phrase. And he put it with a passage from Leviticus, Leviticus 19. Love your neighbors yourself. The genius of Jesus' teachings, he put these two commands together and said, if you do these things, you will have kept the entire law. Now look at your pyramid. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself, and put love in the middle. That is your visual aid for making every decision you will have to make from now on. When you don't know what to do next, pull out this visual aid, look at it, and it will tell you what to do next. Regardless of the decision, you can thank me later. Now, interesting. Jesus redefined every one of these terms. You've heard God, but the good news of Jesus is that God is Father. God is on your side. God is seeking you, not to condemn you, but to redeem you. And it is only God who has the mass. Another word for glory is weight. It is only God who has the spiritual weight, and with weight comes gravity, that has the spiritual gravity to hold the rest of your life in, in its proper order. Seek the kingdom of God first and all of its righteousness, and then everything else will find its place. If anything or anybody is in the center of your life instead of God, your life will fall out of control. Because nothing, if you put your career in the center, it won't hold your marriage together. It won't hold your family together. It's not strong enough. If you put yourself in the middle, your life will, un will unravel. You're not strong enough to hold everything in its proper or orbit. It is only when God is there, the spiritual weight, the spiritual gravity of God, then he holds everything else in place. And when he's in the center of your life, then you are free to love your neighbor. Now, we have a lot of debate in Baptist life about who is my neighbor. And we mean, is it the guy across the street, behind us, two doors down? And we want to know how far do I have to walk down the street before I run into people who aren't my neighbor? Jesus answered this question. In fact, somebody asked him point blank, who is my neighbor? Do you remember Jesus' answer? 
It's in Luke 10. A man was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem and was jumped, beaten up and robbed, left for dead. Two, a bunch of religious leaders walk by, pray for him and move on. A good Samaritan stops. Now the good Samaritan is on the road too. In fact, he doesn't have a home to take the guy to, so he has to take him to a, to a nearby inn. He's not a doctor, so he pays for his care. He gets the guy the kind of help he needs. But he's not on a rescue mission. He's just a guy going about his day. He's not driving around in that big yellow van with rescue on the back with bright red flashing lights that you see on the interstate. That's not the Good Samaritan. He's just a guy. He's a guy who sees somebody who needs help and responds. If you love God, and if you're serious about it, you're going to run into somebody this week who needs you to help. That's your neighbor. Do you know we have a growing crisis in our country? Do you know what that crisis is? Loneliness. People are lonely. You're going to run into people this week who are lonely, who need to be, who need to have a friend who need you to be their friend. Now, you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm barely holding myself together. How in the world am I going to love anybody else? How am I going to be a neighbor to someone else when I, when I can't even be a good friend to me? Because Jesus redefined you as well. See that self? See, I, I know right now a lot of you would pull me aside and go, hey, man, this is a great story. I love it and all, but it doesn't apply to me. You don't know the mistakes I made. You don't know the people I've hurt, on and on and on and on. And it would all be true. But hear me. Jesus redefined you too. Do you know what he says about you? First chapter of Ephesians, you're chosen, picked. I've told you the story before. You go out on the playground, you're going to play some kind of sport. The best athlete chooses teams. Your goal is to be chosen by the best athlete. And if they choose you, you know you're going to win. You still can't play, but because you're on their team, you're going to win. Do you not get that Jesus was walking through the world, found you wherever he found you, called you by name and pointed to you and said, you, I want you on my team. Come get behind me. I'm choosing you. And because you have been picked, Jesus has said there's no one in the world who's strong enough to take you out of my hand. You've been picked. You can't be unpicked chosen, image bearer. You bear the imago dei. You're the person that Christ died for. You're the person that he was raised from the dead for. That's who you are. That means you can love the neighbor out of the overflow of God's love in you. God pours his love into you and the person of Christ and it fills all the cracks, all of the broken places, all of the leaks. You're complete and content in him. You don't need anything from anybody else. Okay, you don't need, I can love you without you having to love me back. It'd be nice, but it's not necessary. Why? Because I am filled with the love of Christ. I have in Christ everything I need. <laughs> People come to me all the time and go, we want to get married. Why do you want to get married? We need each other. That is so sick. <laughs> it's neurotic. Here's the bad news about my marriage. My wife does not need me. She would do fine without me. Might even do better. She doesn't need me. She wants me. Yeah, that's a lot more fun than being needed. I can love you and let you be you. Why? Because I am filled with the love of Christ. You're picked. You're chosen. You're the beloved. And I can love my neighbor. Now, what's that word mean? An intense emotion? No. Jesus redefined it too. No greater love than this, he says in John 15, than a man laid down his life for his friend. You lay down your life for your neighbor. 
I go to my neighbor and say, what do you need from me? And you lay down your life. You go to God, what would you want from me? And you lay down your life. How many of you ever got to that point in your life, in your prayer life? In that moment where you're asking God, what do you want from me? Most of the time we go to God, it's a long list of things we want Him to do for us. We get to the point where you say, I'm laying down my life for you because that's what love is. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Now, the interesting thing about this, you can't do one without doing the other. You've tried it. I have too. Wrote down your New Year's resolution. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to love people better this year. How long did that last? Until you got on the interstate. <laughs> people are too hard, too disappointing, too frustrating to love in your own strength. You love them out of the overflow. Can't hold the ocean in a thimble out of the overflow of Christ's love in you. That's where love of neighbor comes from. You can't love your neighbor unless you know who you are. It comes from an authentic self-love. Our world stinks at this. They stink at it. They tell us we have to have children with high self-esteem. And how do you get a child with high self-esteem? You lie to them. You lie to them. It beats everything I've ever seen. So little Johnny's playing ball. Little Johnny doesn't like ball. Little Johnny's not having a good day. He can't hit a ball, can't catch a ball. He knows it. Everybody on the team hates him because they think he costs them the game. You get in the car. Now, as a good, loving parent, what are you supposed to do to little Johnny? Lie to him. You play great, son. He knows he stunk. Now what's happening? Little Johnny's learning not to trust himself. What does a loving parent say? Ain't no sweat, kid. Baseball's not your thing. That's why you get to be a kid. You get to try a lot of things that aren't your thing. So when you grow up, you can say, hey, it's not my thing. We'll find something. We just now know baseball's not it. No sweat. The world says you have to lie to each other to get healthy self-esteem. No. The Bible says you're picked. chosen. Free to love God. Free to love each other. Free to love yourself. You can't do one without doing the other. And you know the other thing is? You can start with any of it. You can start by loving yourself. That'll lead to loving neighbor. That'll lead to loving God. And you start with loving God. That'll lead to loving God. Loving you can start, anywhere you need to start. Start. Doesn't really matter where. It only matters that you start. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't want to do that. It's just you and me. And I know, listen, there are some of you who are sitting out here listening to me, and you are filled with, safe, with self-hatred. You do not love yourself. You do not even like yourself. And you honestly think the world would be better off without you. You're wrong. God himself thinks you're wrong. You were created because there's a part of the universe, there's a part of creation where you and you alone belong that make the rest of creation all that it is supposed to be. Don't leave this place and not know that you're picked, not know that you're chosen. Some of you are looking for community. You come. Our friends, our counselors, our ministers are at a table under a big sign that says, next step, can't miss it. It's out in the foyer. They're waiting on you now. Don't leave and not know how much you're loved. Don't leave not knowing there are people here who love you. Don't leave lonely. You don't have to. However Christ has come to you, he's waiting for you where you are. 
The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. So we pray now the choices we make are exactly what you want. With all my heart, I want to love you, Lord, and live my life each day to know you more. All that is in me is yours completely. I'll serve you only with all my heart. Would you stand and let's sing this prayer together. Would you join me? With all my heart, I want to love you, Lord, and live my life each day to know you more. All that is in me is yours completely. I'll serve you only with all my heart. May that be your prayer this week. Go in the grace of God today. 